All right, folks, here we are. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone, to Friday the 12th, 7 p.m. Nice to know that YouTube is playing nice with my latest software. Uh, so I had to basically cancel everything down and then uh, jump into YouTube and do this manually because, of course, I do. Uh, so no fanciness tonight. We're going to be using it, uh, YouTube's interface like we did last time, unfortunately. So who we got? Mr. Buell, you're here first. Congratulations. Hello, my friend from Arkansas. How is the inbreeding going over there? I was really excited because I, I had um, uh, some software set up where I could also do like screen sharing and stuff like that. And for some reason, every time I tried, I was trying to get this thing started as of like 6.40 and uh, YouTube would just not allow it to connect. I don't know if it's because this was a pre-generated stream or what the heck was going on, but just something wasn't happening. So feel free to drop something in the chat. Yes, thing's not. Big talk for Florida men. Hey, who's world famous and who's a nobody? Okay, that's all. That's all I'm gonna say. If you said Arkansas man, ain't no one know who Arkansas man is. Florida man, bro. There are places in the world where they don't speak English, and you say Florida man, and they immediately hide their children and lock their doors. We have gotten around. <clears throat> <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, two thirds, don't it? <clears throat> it's like Larry Bird walking into the uh third three point competition. Looking around and just going, All right, just wanted to see who's here fighting for second. It's Florida man, dude. Aster Beckham, woken from your nap yesterday, huh? Congratulations to you with all of your New graduates, since your commencement was yesterday at Florida State College of Jacksonville. <clears throat> uh, you know what? I can't even give Mr. Buell crap in Arkansas because y'all just had someone over there selling like skulls and body parts and stuff. So that's uh, y'all catching up to Florida, man. Y'all really catching up to Florida, man. Don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but. We can go from there. <laughs> Dr. Evely, you're back for more. How are you doing, ma'am? Everything going well for you? Let's just get that. <laughs> hey, man, you cannot compete for the Florida man title if uh, you're not willing to go ahead and throw down with the rest of the slop. I mean, whew. you're good. Site visit complete. Congratulations, sir. I bet that is going to uh, exponentially reduce the number of gray hairs you will be getting over the next couple of weeks. <laughs> We're still in trouble here in Miami. We, we, we got our adjusted uh, we got our adjusted pass rates, and we're still in the fifties. But the good news is the numbers are up. They're up in single digits, like you know, three and four percent. But um, <clears throat> they are up from last year. So I will take the small wins where I can get them, man. I will absolutely do that. Uh. Let's see here. 
I was going to pull something up, and then I got excited that uh, Dr. Buford showed up. <laughs> I had a lively little thing going on with um, some of my students on uh, online discussion board. We were talking, or I, I do this thing that I have a lot of fun with. I usually do it in midterms week, just to, especially for online students to keep them engaged, keep them kind of sane. Uh, where it's ask the prof anything. And it generally is ask the prof something not about this class. Because the week prior to the midterm, uh, especially my online students, I like to do a muddiest point discussion, you know, ask me something that you want me to clarify and then spend hour to two hours going over all the muddiest point videos or uh, questions in the discussions and providing answers, demonstrating stuff like that. So during midterms week, they can do that again, or they can just ask me some like anything they want about any of the subjects or ongoing funeral stuff. And um, the good time was uh, one of them brought up the FTC thing. They, they, they brought up uh, FTC wants to put GPLs on websites. <coughs> they were talking about NPR. And I was just in a, I was in a bad mood, man, because that caught me completely just, okay, yeah, let's talk about that, man. You didn't, think you were calling down the thunder, but my God, here comes the second out of the seven plagues. And um, I, I really jumped in on it because it's like not a single bit of any of the research that anyone has presented on the uh, regulatory side has shown that this is going to prevent a single violation. Um, all of the arguments for it were not a result of uh, potential for abuse or violation. It was because it's going to make things easier. Um, and I'm like, dude, we don't create regulations just because you want to be able to order milkshakes easier driving through, you know, whatever. If they want to make it easier, they'll make it easier because they want to make more money because, you know, Chick-fil-A is the, is the God level of ordering stuff via car. So it's like I'm not a fan of putting that stuff on priceless just because the government feels like doing it. And if we're going to do that, then by all means, let's do it. And let's change the definition so it's funeral goods and services. So that way, if it's about a level playing field and everyone can compare prices, let's do that. I think it'd be wonderful if Costco and the Casket Depot and Sam's Club and Walmart and all the other drop shippers are required in the United States to use the FTC, sweetest smelling federal regulatory commission in the world, approved form so that we all have to do the same exact things. Because if we put the form on our website, wouldn't it be so much easier if everyone had the same form and then we could just all just look at it and, you know, at $16,000 a violation, imagine if you're the FTC and you just went from 3,500 funeral homes to like 40,000 businesses. Like, my God, wouldn't you want to do that? Can you imagine the Maserati you would afford? <laughs> uh, working on legislation uh, to license third-party storage facilities in Michigan. Y'all catch up to Florida. Florida's already got that. You have to have a license in order to be a um, a storage facility. So if, if you want to be like a removal facility and hold bodies, you have to have a removal facility license. If you're going to be storing, bo <coughs> storing bodies, typically that's done by uh, central preps. Um, our, our preparation facility license is for people who do not want to offer uh, embalming services to the public. So if you want to be a central prep or a body storage or removal or something like that, you have to get one of these licenses in order to engage in business. Um, so even if you're not going to store, you have, they, they got you on the radar. Uh, Howard Wright, still a challenge getting the really good students to take the boards. Dude, what? why do you think I'm dreading at some point? Because um, I, I know whether I like it or not, even though I'm not in charge anymore, I'm going to be part of that conversation if um, the American Board of Funeral Service Education puts us on probation or something like that. Like, what are we going to do to fix it? And I don't know how to fix it if they're taking tests eight months into the gate. Like, I, it's really hard for me to take criticism that I am not doing my job as an educator, and this is preaching to the choir for all of the educators out there, um, that it's your fault when someone waits six to eight months after they graduate to take the test. And then you have to look at what you do and your things that are in place somehow that you can affect that. I mean, even to the point where I know some of you, uh, I've had some conversations out there, whether you're listening now, listening in later, that you pay for their exam. 
like you pay for their board exam and they're still waiting. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so resistant down here to pay for the exam ahead of time is if they're not what is we require them to pay for it now, if we start taking that away from them, they're even more inclined to just go ahead and wait. So it's not their money. So when we were discussing this here in Miami, we're trying to figure out ways to do that. You have to take the exam within 30 days. Like you have to take the exam within 30 days or we're simply not going to reimburse you the 600 bucks. And yeah, you got to pass the exam because you're not going to just pay for it for you to walk in there and determine, you know, what type of air fresheners we're using at Pearson View testing centers. But I think that, and I think one of the things we're on the right track with at the American board is we're looking for ways to uh, try to determine program excellence, not just on that metric because of the fact it is going to be so hard to determine quality of law school. Like I can't imagine if a law school graduated someone, um, if law school commencements were happening in say August 1st and the next opportunity to take the bar exam is in January, and we'll say for the sake of argument, they eliminated all the bar review courses at like six to $10,000 a pop. So now you literally had a four month wait between graduating from law school and then taking uh, your multi-state bar. I would love to see what the pass rates for people uh, attempting a Juris Doctor and trying to get uh, their, their law license. I would love to see what the pass rates are. And unsurprisingly, I think when we see that the pass rates for even the best law schools in the nation drop to about maybe 30%, the ABA would be forced to take some steps at looking at how they accredit their law schools, knowing that, hey, man, no one can graduate law school in August and take a bar exam four months later and not have something in between to keep them, like, tidied over. And as we see more and more people getting lazy and playing with, like, chat GPT and these other AI generators, uh, I don't think that the quality of candidates, even for professional programs, is is going to continue to be high. So this is an exciting time to watch the uh, the world burn. Uh, how about CBS Sunday mornings free uh, ad for Titan Casket? Uh, I, I don't watch TV. You know that. I don't watch TV at all. Uh, not even broadcast. So, uh, and, you know, an excellent point. What about people, you know, not just Titan Casket, let's look at um, Masterpiece Casket. Masterpiece Casket produces arguably the best, if not some of the best wooden caskets I have ever seen. Like they blow everybody away, but that's all they sell. And they can sell directly from their website. They're not obligated by law, by federal law, to post on their website a casket price list or a general price list offering their services because all they offer is goods. So I don't see how it is fair at all for people who only sell one product that are not even regulated in the field to go after and bully the people who are regulated in the field when they sell an identical thing. I mean, that that's crazy to me. And if the if you're going to regulate it, don't regulate the funeral home, regu regulate the product, regulate the service. So if you want to engage in that behavior, if you want to do something in that field, it shouldn't matter if you're a funeral home or you're a dentist. You want to sell caskets. The price for doing business is that you must all follow, fall under the same regulation, have the same exact things, use the same exact forms if your intent is to protect the consumer. That's all there is to it. It's cut and dry. It's black and white for me. It can't be, well, funeral homes have to do all these extra things, and then we can jeopardize their licenses, and they have to obey all this, but Walmart can sell the same $8,000 box, and they don't have to deal with any of it because, oh, well, you know, they're not engaged in actually making funerals, so then what is it? It can't be consumer protection. It has to be picking on funeral homes. And I forget what the statistic was, but the violations of the FTC funeral rule and people going into the NFDA offenders program are some of the lowest numbers we've ever had. So there's clearly not a lot of abuse about people um, violating at least a federal rule. Now, I see lots of people getting in trouble with some crazy pricing stuff uh, in other states because they're via because the state uses its own form or something else. But this isn't like it was in the 80s. Like, it's not even close to the way it was in the 80s. Squid, you made it. Hey, Navy girl. Congratulations, you didn't sleep through it this time. <laughs> uh, 
How you doing over there? I saw your uh, I saw your your little one had a little trip to the dentist. She doing okay after that? You, you said on Facebook she wasn't crying or anything, so I assume that went exceptionally well. Uh, Mark writes, uh, was a gap in our law. Several popped up and they're completely unregulated. <laughs> yeah, that'll catch your attention quick, uh, especially when they're buying the walk-in coolers and storing their Tegenos and their Miller Lite next to uh, John Smith's grandpa, right? <laughs> Overall pass rate for February Florida bar exam was 50. Holy, sh well, dude, it's Florida. We can't read or write. Yeah, we're still marrying our first cousins down here. <laughs> but isn't that crazy? Like, isn't that crazy? Uh, if you want to practice in Florida and you're graduating from places like Florida State or University of Florida, University of Miami, um, those are probably the premier law schools in Florida. And don't take me wrong. I, I know Stetson's like high up in there as well. Uh, but if you're looking for like <coughs> Florida practice, I'd probably say those are the four big law schools in Florida, UM, US, uh, UF, uh, FSU, and Stetson Law. And unless their individual pass rates are higher than that, I, that's, that, that's pretty crazy. Like that's really crazy. Man, the expense of that, like, I don't know what it's, what it's, how much it costs in order to go to um, the state schools, but I think university at Miami, you're to go to their law school, dude, you're dropping some bank. Like you're, you're at least getting close or passing 200 grand. And you have a 50% chance of passing the Florida bar. Bruh. We're good. And you know what's going to happen? What's going to end up happening is we're going to see an extension of um, what paralegals can do. So everyone's going to want to become a paralegal because they're going to be able to make good and quick money so they can take the pressure off the lawyers, just like what we're seeing right now with um, physician assistants, physician assistants, and people going to med school. I was doing great. Got the bracer removed this morning. Good for her. That's where I make her super happy. Uh, A-M-E. A-M-E. American Methodists. Uh, what? <sighs> Risha, how you doing, sweetheart? Can't stay away from me. Just saw you on Tuesday, and now you're talking to me on Friday. My God, your wife's going to say something. <laughs> it's not too crazy out there, is it? You it was amen. Uh, yeah, so 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 I I know that like Hebrew doesn't have vowels, but you got to put you got to put that last consonant on it. Buddy, thank you. Uh, it was amen uh, at the moment. African Methodist Episcopal, right? Uh, see, one letter matters because we've gone from a domination to so would it be. <laughs> 50 days before I leave Spain and head back to the U.S. Uh-oh, you better uh, get in all the, um, uh, oh, God, what the heck is it? But yeah, yeah, you can while you're over there. I'll be in text between July and August for a law enforcement school that the Navy waited 15 years to send me to. Well, that's good. They got you there sooner rather than later, right? You wanted to make sure they had, like, it, all the bugs worked out before they sent you there. Let me know when you're in Texas. Like, shoot me a holler. Uh, that'll give me an excuse to go over and, like, Pay Dallas Institute a visit. Say hi. Bar exam was more difficult. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, more when, I, I suppose that's one of the things that I also get upset about when people are trying to compare bar exams to like the National Board exam for funeral service. It's like, bro, come on. Post postgraduate degree versus two year degree. We shouldn't be comparing these things. Like, <laughs> two of these things, one of these things is not like the other. Can we guess which one it is? I'll give you a hint. Maybe the one we're not writing an essay for. <laughs> we don't typically sit there and look at both sides of why we actually want to embalm them well and then how to defend why we didn't embalm them well. <laughs> no, come on, man. Dear God almighty. <laughs> uh, July 12th to August 24th. Kick ass. Angela, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, can you talk about oil-based arterial fluid? Yes, it's wonderful Wonderful with a balsamic reduction. Add it to some bruschetta and then some fresh basil, maybe some mozzarella. It makes a hell of a caprese salad. 
uh, for, and beefsteak tomatoes. <laughs> so oil-based arterials. Um, oil-based arterials. <clears throat> People like to, I, I think, focus on these product selling ideas where ours are strictly land. We use silicon technology. We're using state-of-the-art humectants like vegetable glycerin that Alfredo Salofia was using in 1932. Um, so realistically, what is the purpose of the oil? The oil is there to serve as a humectant. So most of the humectant chemicals that you see, and the reason why this matters when like choosing maybe a natural emollient versus a fake emollient is because that's going to determine what your chemical components of your arterial solution are going to be. Certain things play well better than others. So uh, an easy example of this is when you're going through mortuary school, they make you study the active dyes, right? ESI and erythrazine. Really, the only two that you should study at all because you don't have to care about anything else is ESI and erythrazine because they're the fake ones and they're the only ones that play well with formalin solution. Because all the others, cochineal, cud bear, etc., these are based off of proteins, whether it's animal proteins in the form of uh, the bugs or it's plant proteins in the form of the moss. And if you put that stuff in with formalin, it reacts with it. So when you're choosing something, like I think it's uh, Frigid likes to uh, talk about its silicon technology. There are other places that use silicon and lanolin and just glycerin and whatever else for um, for uh, humectant purposes. So the question becomes, does the product work the way that you want it to on the cases, the majority of cases you get? So I can tell you me personally, one of my favorite chemicals to use in the prep room because I can choose from any supplier I want is I love using Energized from Pierce Chemical. And right on, I think, Energized's label, it says oil-based fluid. And I can tell you that I don't care any differently if I'm using Energized or I'm using NXT30 or I'm using Manhattan. Those are all Pierce chemicals. One on the label happens to say it's oil-based. Do I get excellent preservation with NXT30? Energized is 36 index. NXT is, uh, comes in two versions, a medium 20 index and a higher grade 30. And I want to say Manhattan um, is a 30 index. So I can use these three chemicals almost interchangeably. Um, I don't suppose I would have a preference of one versus another, literally, unless someone is paying me to say that. Uh, I can't think of anything oil-based on the label from the Dodge catalog. Someone in chat can go ahead and correct me. Um, if you know uh, an oil-based uh, chemical in the Dodge catalog, um, I would probably hazard a guess if we're just going to go by taste tests that something oil based on Dodge catalog because it looks like something like energized is probably like medicine 30, medicine 35, 30 or 35. I can't remember. It's the high end medicine in the Dodge catalog. That looks like it could have very similar chemical components, uh, but they're not going to share that information on the SDS sheets as to what all these proprietary formulations are uh, because whether it's lanolin or whether it's silicon, what's going to kill you is going to be the formula if you try to drink it. <clears throat> so um, I wouldn't freak out too much about oil-based versus non-oil-based. Uh, go with what you know. So stick to, like, if we're looking for preservation, which is what we're always looking for, stick at the 2%. Stick at the minimum 2%, just like the textbook says. Uh, if you get familiar with the math, and how to run the equations so that you can determine actual formaldehyde uh, demand to meet your uh, protein load, then you're probably going to end up using an oil base that at 36, probably going to use like three to four bottles of it. If you're dropping it down to like 20, you're probably going to have to maybe use five to six bottles of it. And when you use those quantities, you're probably going to see that you're affecting good preservation. What I usually see is, especially in the higher index stuff, usually see extra dye in it because it's basing itself off that concept. You're going to have to use less of it uh, so you don't like dehydrate bodies or something like that. And probably the stuff you're reaching for 36 index needs that extra dye as tracers and everything else. So when you're putting in 
those three bottles, you're getting something that visually is going to work with the body uh, once the dyes start, start to distribute. So you probably don't want to put in six bottles of that stuff. But if the chemical company is doing its job well, knowing you should be using five bottles of this, then put in those five bottles at 20 index, you're probably going to see you're going to get excellent cosmetics, uh, a cosmetic result than you've been getting. Because what you probably do is like two, two bottles and two and a half to three gallons and then put in two ounces of dye because the color just doesn't get where you want it. Because you're not putting in nearly enough preservative to meet formaldehyde and the formaldehyde demand of a 150 pound body. So I was very shocked. And I, and I discovered that little thing happening when I was working with, what was it? I think it was Manhattan. We just got in a case of Manhattan. It was the first time we'd used it. And um, I was working, my coworker at the time was a professor by the name of John Carlo Luera, uh, an Obama from Texas. And one night, just for the giggles of it, because I'm old school, man, two bottles, three bottles, tops, add your dye, co-injections, crap like that, and juice it up. And I just wanted to use five bottles, six bottles for some reason. I'm just like, you know what? I don't feel like putting dye in this. I wonder what happens if I just put an extra two bottles of the, of the preservative. Let's see what happens. And I got picture perfect color the next day, like walked in and just, wow, that looks really good. And um, Professor Luera walked in. It was like, hey, what'd you do to that body? That looked really good. How much dye did you add? And I said, none. And he thought I was screwing with him. I'm like, no, bro. Instead of using two and a half to three bottles, I used five. And that's the result. So then I started doing that with all my chemicals in that range of 20 index, adding five, adding six bottles to two and a half to three gallons. I think usually it was a Dodge machine, so it's three gallons. And all of a sudden, I'm getting like perfect color one after another. It's like watching vintage Larry Bird just dumping buckets from the three-point line. Every time he shoots at it, it just goes right through. Like I couldn't believe I was getting that cosmetic effect. Uh, Mr. Heath, good evening. How are you? Uh, Howard, there seems to be a lot of funeral service openings. Are educators leaving? Dude, we've been leaving in droves for like the last three years. <laughs> <laughs> my god the question is not do you want to work in education anymore the question is where do you want to work in education i honestly think the whole reason why the american board of funeral service education even has to have an administrative assistant and i love trudy to death make no doubt i love trudy to death her job is completely justified just sending out job notices any of us who've been around for probably 10 years we, we, we remember what it was like back in 2012, 2013, maybe an education posting came up once every three or four years. And now there seems to be on a running basis, three to five places, always looking for something. And at varying levels, not just professors, like everything. And anything like that's going to have a dramatic effect on the industry. Uh, hello from Sebring. Yay. I love Sebring. I've been there a couple of times. Uh, Howard writes, will eco-friendly, non-formaldehyde fluid actually persuade family to choose embalming that costs significantly move? God, hell no. Not even close. The end result is crap. Everything about it is crap on the formaldehyde-free stuff. And if you're actually going to use the stuff that the Green Burial Council um, advocates as approved for green embalming, that's 35 bucks a bottle. So if you have to use that in significant quantities, so if we're going to say... If we look at Pierce Chemical and we look at um, Dodge Chemical Companies, uh, I forget what the name of it is at Pierce, but the Dodge catalog, uh, their green product is something called Freedom Art. And you buy it literally in a gallon bucket. It comes, it comes in a, uh, a gallon container. So if we are looking at <clears throat> 5 by 16, uh, if, we're, if we're looking at this normally, right? So uh, it takes eight bottles. It takes eight bottles to equal a gallon, eight 16-ounce bottles to equal 128 ounces. And if we have to pay $35 per bottle, that's nearly $300 in consumable cost, $300 just in the chemical to pour into your tank to pour another gallon of water on top of it. So if you look at the instructions for use for Freedom Art, you have to use it. Whole gallon, one case, not intended for anything with complications, which is 
goddamn insane considering that just about everybody these days is living longer than they should because of the miracles of modern medication so that they are having more and more catastrophic health failures prior to getting to the prep table which means the need for preservation is going to be greater because you're getting into the you're getting into that decomposition cycle even quicker. So now what you're going to do is you're going to attack them with basically an alcohol-based salt solution whose job is to flush water out um, and I can't imagine they're using carbolic acid as a preservative. So the only main preservative they can be using in this thing has to be salts and alcohols because those are the two more mo those are the two organic ones. So, like, how do you even how do you even justify that level of expenditure? Especially in comparison to 280 bucks for one case, you can probably buy like two and a half, three cases of interfiant with Dynachrome from Dodge, and that's purple Jesus. That gets it done. It doesn't matter if you found it on Mars, you found it in a trailer. That's gonna embalm it. The cost is ridiculous. So I don't think uh, people going to this green funeral stuff, they're not going to be choosing embalming as we know it. And they cannot expect the result of embalming as we know it with the products that they are producing because it simply doesn't do the same exact thing. This is not like the impossible burger. You cannot use this as a substitute. This is something that is completely different. So um, I tried making my own stuff. I actually did an experiment here in Miami, and I used Costco vodka, food-grade vegetable glycerin, and I made a gallon of a solution based off of the components that I saw in a uh, commercial green preservative by a major chemical company. And then I followed it up with standard dilution. So I used five or six bottles of a traditional co-injection. In my case, I used ProFlow uh, from Dodge Chemical Company. I added... Um, three ounces of dye from um, uh, Icterine from, no, it wasn't Icterine, I'm sorry, it's Intertone. I think it was Intertone number eight from Dodge Chemical. So, and I, I had to add three ounces of dye because I had no other active dyes in this thing. So all the dye I was getting was coming from this. And it made about a two and a half gallon uh, solution. And I injected it into a body. At the same time, I injected Freedom Art into another body, similar conditions, controlled setting in my lab as much as I can get that um, with the indigents that I get. And the results were the, the results were very similar. Just using Costco vodka and um, vegetable glycerin. And people can get bent, people can get like really ripped up about it. But bro, ethanol is ethanol. And if I don't have formaldehyde, I really don't need methanol because I don't have to worry about the stabilizing agent. So any alcohol is going to work. The cheapest alcohol I can find is the cheapest alcohol I can find, and the Costco vodka is pretty high-proof stuff. I can't afford Everclear. I'm not going to distill my own moonshine, but I can use some 160-proof alcohol to some good effect here. So um, we can even compound our own stuff very, very easily. And recently they found a little note card as to what the formulation was that uh, Alfredo Salafia used to embalm the Sleeping Beauty, Rosalia Lombardo. And he used a combination of formalin solution, glycerin, um, oh crap, I don't remember the other stuff that was on there, but the main preservative was formalin. The second portion was glycerin to keep the skin from drying out, and he used those two components in equal measure. And he's able to embalm her so she looks like she's perfect 112 years later. And he's using the formalin from the early 1900s, before we discovered surfactants, before we discovered stabilizing agents so we can hold the formaldehyde and really get it in there. This is the stuff. You put it on there, it turns it gray, and it gets it done. Uh, and Sal Salafia was doing that in the 1930s. So really, really good stuff. Uh, can you please discuss ascites? Ascites is the buildup of water in your abdomen to be distinguished from anasarca, which is generalized water buildup throughout your entire body. So, fun part about ascites. It's like you drank three gallons of water. And how do you fix it? You grab Mr. Pokey over here. Stick it right in there. Suck all the water out. Ascites problem solved. Literally, ascites problem solved. Second fun part. Usually when you get ascites or something like that, what ends up happening is you try to put cavity fluid in there, and the the bottle doesn't fit, right? You can't put in the standard two or three bottles. Well, here's the fun part. 
cavity fluid's goal is to suck water out of things. Uh, you have some excellent products in the market, like Frigid has a product called Stump. It has a zero index. It has no formaldehyde because it's completely carbolic acid based, based off of phenol. And the way phenol preserves is by scorching and dehydrating. It's why we use this as a cauterant chemical because it pulls moisture out and it burns things like an acid. Really cool thing that um, the, the, the carbolic acid phenol does what it does because it really should be an alcohol like methanol or ethanol. Chemically, you look at it and it's just like, yeah, this shouldn't be taking your flesh clean off your bones. So what you do and what I've advised people when you have like a lot of water in there because of this buildup is get the first bottle in there. Let it sit as long as you can, two hours, three hours. Go back in and re-aspirate. When you go back in to re-aspirate, you're going to suck out more water that just pooled, water that the stuff is pulling out of the organs. So now you're probably getting another like a quarter so out. By now, you should be able to fit in two bottles fully because there are some states like Texas that say you have to put in two bottles to legally comply with the preservation requirement for the state. So under Texas law, you've now put in three bottles. One is a pregame in order to pull some moisture out so you can get more water out, and now two to try to preserve. And then let that sit in for the standard amount, overnight, next morning, 24 hours, whatever. And like all good embalming, monitor your case. Monitor the case. And don't be afraid to re-aspirate and reapply product. You know, I just complained about paying three, uh, I, I think the number was $280 if you're going to use eight bottles of green approved chemical at $35 a bottle. For every bottle of that, you can use two bottles of cavity chemical. It's cheaper than dirt. It's 16 bucks. And some of you folks are charging $500, $800, $1,200 dollars for embalming. Even if you use six bottles of cavity fluid, or six bottles of a uh, quality arterium, you use four bottles of cavity fluid because you had to aspirate, inject, and then re-aspirate and re-inject. You put in a bottle of a, of a buffer, of a water conditioner. You put in one or two bottles of your, um, of your co-injection, like ProFlow or One Point or something like that. Bruh, you're only in the chemical for a hundred bucks, if even that. You're going to lose the 100 bucks just in your attorney responding to the letter that you get because you screwed it up. So use the product. I mean, I can't imagine an attorney is just going to draft you a letter, even one on retainer, for less than probably 150 to 250 bucks. Like, it's going to cost you money. So use the extra two bottles. Cut back on the chance that might actually happen. <clears throat> so, uh, Ascites. A lot of people get this wrong on test. Do not worry. If you just have ascites, the ascites itself is not something you factor into the chemicals you should be using to preserve the tissues. So when you're choosing your arterial, if you have ascites by itself and you have normal tissue conditions everywhere else, the ascites is a non-issue. Reach for the 20 index or something. And then until you see a complication or something going wrong, probably no need to kick it up. Some people are probably going to challenge me on that and say, well, that no, 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 no. Well, the only thing the ascites dilutes is the cavity fluid. So if it's not in the tissues, then you have no reason to go strong on ascites because your interfiant or your power tone vivid or your trauma care doesn't touch it. Now, if you have ascites and normal tissue moisture and you find out that they died because of mid-grade renal failure. Different story. Your kidneys are rotting. You got crap built up everywhere. Yeah, feel free to go ahead and reach for the trauma care. But the ascites is not something you should freak out about. Poke a hole, drain the water out. And if you know it's ascites right up front, don't even wait. Do, with, do one of the two things the textbook says. People don't like to say the textbook teaches you the stuff for school you're never going to use in real life. <laughs> no. Everything in that book is pure gold. Take a scalpel, poke a hole, if you want to be the careful version, take the scalpel, poke the hole, take the tip out of the trocar, insert the trocar into the standard point of entry, or make the incision right above the inguinal ligament and insert this basically right next to the genitals and suck the fluid out because if anything is going to make your life miserable from the ascites, 
uh, during injection. It's just going to be the water pressure pushing down on your aorta and pushing down on your vena cava, thus screwing anything going into your legs. And once it's in the legs, stuff coming out because that might affect the fact you're not getting blood out of the legs, which means your legs are going to gray up, but who's going to care? Because most people aren't going to be viewed in like a mankini or something. We're going to be seeing the legs. So ascites is not really like a major, major, major problem uh, because to fix it, it's so easy. Problem is when ascites is built with anasarca, where you have water in the tissues, which is leading you to either solid edema or pitting edema, now you have to factor in that edema to your injection. And if I recall, the textbook even says it's usually uncommon that you get both. It happens, but it's usually one or the other. And I usually find that I probably have more gas buildup on the bodies that I get here in the lab. Uh, when I have uh, anasarca, water throughout all the tissues, uh, then I get water building up in the abdomen, pushing things down. Again, that's just what I see. And that is probably not dispositive for the entirety of the United States. Uh, Matt Buell with the war on education. Well, that's been happening for a while now. But you'd be happy to know that Governor Ron DeSantis, the sweetest smelling governor in the world, recently signed into law that Florida schools must teach um, Asian American and um, uh, uh, Pacific American uh, history in schools in Florida. So we must be discussing things like the Japanese internment camps and the invasion of Hawaii and stuff like that. So uh, the war in education continues here in Florida, but at least it's probably like the smart thing to do. Talk about the fact that we're dumbasses and put people in internment camps we shouldn't have. Um, William, predictions on how automation and or AI impact the industry in, in the next five to 10 years. When you call to do a first call, the AI takes the first call. <laughs> AI obituary condolences letters, eulogies today. What's in the horizon beyond high volume online cremation? Uh, which you, did, yeah, you just answered your own question. People don't even want to write their own discussion boards. They, they go into one of the chat things and they type in a response and it throws them and they just copy and paste it. So you're going to have people that have like, the, the level of intelligence of the vinyl piping literally covering the tip of this trocar because they don't know how to read and write themselves. The computer is going to do it for them. Now, there's a wonderful TED Talk out there that Professor Buell from Arkansas State University Mountain Home was telling me. Um, I think it was Carl Kahn. Uh, Matt, I think that's who you said it was. How AI can help in the classroom uh, because if it can write a paper, it can teach you. It can literally teach you. So you can ask it a question. It can help you understand something. Now, if we start blending in that with like robotics technology, we can have basically virtual tutors. We literally have Robin Williams's Millennium Man. We can start having these robot assistants at home. I was reading an article this morning, uh, a couple of months ago when I got my tax return uh, and, I, and I felt like spending some cash. I dropped the dumb amount of money it was, and I got myself an Amazon Astro, which is a cute little home automated robot. And I just found that the new version, they codenamed it Project Burnham. And I don't know if that means it's also going to be in, like a software upgrade for the model that I have, but it's going to have uh, AI integration from these chatbots built into this new version for sure, and maybe as an upgrade. And what this does, this is the cool stuff, right? Because chat GPT and stuff like that don't need to access the internet. So now we're going back. If you look right back there, you look right in back of me, you can see three robot dogs sitting on the shelf, the Sony Ibo series. I have a, a ERS-111, which, uh, 110, which is the one in the middle. That was the first little robot dog they made. And then next to it on each side, I have um, the ERS-220 and I have the ERS-210. What differs from this versus the current Sony iBo, these don't need to hook up to the internet. All the processing is done via the software sticks, which means now we're going back from using things like Amazon Web Services where you have to talk into the internet to get something done because it has to send out to the, the supercomputer and it has to come back. If we can build this stuff into local technology again, it can be completely separated from the internet. That can make it 
more secure in, in a lot of ways. It complies with a lot more laws, stuff like that. Um, and also it frees up the supercomputers, the big number crunchers, to do other things instead of determine like what color socks you should be wearing that day. Um, <clears throat> I see automation. I haven't put, I, I'll be honest, I haven't put a lot of thought into how it's going to impact the funeral industry. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if we start seeing, um, if we're going to have self-driving cars, why can't we have self-driving backhoes? I can't go to Sam's Club without having a, an automated floor sweeper try to walk around me as I'm pushing my cart. Then who says we can't have automated lawnmowers in cemeteries? And if we can have an automated backhoe, we don't need four people standing around digging a six-foot hole. We can let the backhoe do it without a one operator. So there, AI is going to impact a lot of stuff. And the 5G is going to – this started happening with 5G because 5G gave us the speeds we need for things and mobile devices to connect to the Internet, make decisions, and come back quickly. Now if we can take it away from 5G and put it back on the unit, that's just the, that's just the evolution of the next thing. Uh, thank you for that. I was able to follow you, and that makes sense. Good. I'll send you my bill. You know, I won't even send you the bill. I'll, I'll go ahead and send it to uh, Professor Beckham. He's, he's, he makes more money than I do. He, he's independently wealthy. Uh, that is what I told my students, but the greenies seem to think it is the future. Well, of course it is. Of course it is. Like, you, you, we have to be ignorant not to recognize that a significant part of the population is going to go in this direction. Uh, and as you term, and I use similar terms, greenies, greenheads, whatever it is, um, what I always love is when they go in to get their green service and they realize it's $9,000 and they think it's not going to be $9,000 for human composting or natural organic reduction, however you want to refer to it. It's like the stuff ain't cheap. Like the stuff ain't cheap. And right now, especially natural organic reduction is not scalable to mass casualty events. You have 30,000 people. You're not going to compost them. I promise you, you're not going to compost them. You're either going to mass bury them. You're going to burn them. And then maybe you might hydrolyze them. But in order, you will dig a big hole and dump them, or you will find a bunch of pizza ovens to use them, because you can probably do, uh, on a big unit, U.S. cremations or um, Matthews unit or B&L cremation systems. We're talking one of their big boys, the ones that can do like 350 pounds an hour. You can probably, no pun intended, burn through probably like eight or nine bodies a day. You can't do that in a hydrolyzer. I don't care which one it is, whether it's water resumation or just vanilla flavored alkaline hydrolysis. The most you're going to do per day is probably maybe four or five at best. And you're running that unit nonstop one after another for the entire work shift with at least one in overtime because hydrolyzers usually take around three hours to process. If your oven is up to temp, you can get through 120 pounds in probably about 45 minutes in one of these big ovens because of the retained heat and the fact it can just go and go and go. Now, with both of these units, there are disadvantages. With the flame cremation, you're going to have to let the damn thing cool down at some point. We can probably run it a full day, three shifts, and before you have to let it sit and cool for a day. Hydrolyzer, you can almost run it constantly without any consideration whatsoever. So you have the option to run this thing literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I think it only ever gets up to about 300 degrees. Your problem's then going to be, can you get enough lye in, um, in, in the canisters to keep the unit functioning at that level and at that pace? And do you have the infrastructure, the storage tanks? Because I don't think I know of a single commercial consumer unit not a one of them anywhere in the United States, not the resumator at the Anderson McQueen Family Tribute Center in St. Petersburg, Florida, not Bradshaw's Life Tribute Centers in Minnesota. I don't know a single one that pours straight down the pipe that stays in steady operation because it almost never gets the equation right straight out of the machine. So it has to go into the holding tank and you have to test it. And that means you have to add in more chemical and you have to wait until it returns neutral before you can flush it into there and comply with your wastewater settings or your wastewater ordinances. 
So the problem becomes, no matter which one of those two technologies you use, you're going to have some downtime. And I think personally, the better technology is probably the flame cremation, especially if your death rate's going to go crazy or you have a mass casualty event. Um, uh, William, charge more for green embalming them. Exactly. I mean, you can't be stupid. If it's going to cost you $300 in consumables, you're going to have to pay more for it. You want that? I mean, I have no beef for people that want natural organic reduction. I have a beef with people who want natural organic reduction expect to pay $9.95 for it. Like, you're not going to get that. And you're sure as hell not going to get the $4.95 turn and burn direct cremation from a storefront sitting next to a 7-Eleven right next to a dispensary. Like, you're not going to walk in, set up the cremate grandma, buy some edibles, and get a Slurpee before you get back in the car. It's just not going to happen. So expect to pay some cash for this stuff, especially while we try to scale this technology into a fashion where it works. I'm happy to invest in natural organic technology. Someone tell me who needs some cash that I can get a decent return on investment, and I'll happily throw some, some non-essential cash their way. But I'm not naive enough to believe for a second that if we had 10,000 people die, that natural organic reduction is going to be a technology that's even viable to assist in something like that. Because maybe I think the large units will hold like 30 or 40 bodies at a time. Well, you do the math and see how long it's going to take you to do 30 or 40 bodies every two and a half to three weeks until you get to 10,000. Like, can you imagine the refrigeration facilities you would need? We wouldn't, we'd have to stack hangers, airplane hangers that can fit like 777s seven, seven, with refrigeration and stack bodies like 20 or 30 high just to be able to hold them that long. The sailor writes with the type of green embalming. Uh, some customers will want, for kosher purposes, are we going to have to separate embalming machine uh, altogether? No, not really. No. Uh, and a part of that is, you know, considering kosher laws, you, you can't, just because it's green doesn't mean it's kosher. Like any sort of preservation of the dead under any um, any of the, tra of the traditional Abrahamic religions, whether that's Islam, whether that's Judaism, um, they're not going to permit anything like that. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Buell, and then the inferior bodies, uh, male visitations, even less popular, and the beat goes on. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, again, <laughs> you get what you pay for. And you cannot say these things are equal because they're not. If you need the body preserved and you want to preserve it for a long period of time and you want to make sure that you can hold this thing for like 35 days and not have to care, you're not going to find a better preserver than formalin solution. You're just not. It does not exist with the current technologies that we have. 91% uh, isopropyl at Big Lots. Perfect. Because that's the other third alcohol, right? You have isopropanol, you have uh, ethanol, and you have methanol. Sal, it wasn't Carl, it was Sal, thank you. Sal Khan, um, he just did a TED Talk. Mr. Buell told me it just popped up like 11 days ago, so it's a really, really new TED Talk. Yeah, it becomes every student's tutor and every teacher's TA. Yeah, like, perfect. And it, we have such a limited amount of stuff out there, it's not like an AI couldn't learn our, our stuff just like lickety-split. I mean, it's learning entire centuries worth of laws. Like, uh, even chat GPT, which is now like the 1960s version of an AI that could learn every nation's laws for the last 2000 years. And you could probably ask it to compare how a case would come out. Give, give me a legal essay based on the laws of uh, Thailand versus uh, the laws of England in 1066 on insert random crime. And it would absolutely be able to spit out something writable for you. Uh, AI becomes every student's tutor. Blah, blah, blah. Squid writes, when the Amazon robot with AI, uh, you're going to be able to have a real-life robot in Frank's... Yeah, absolutely. Like, I will literally be okay to die at any moment where I can come home and talk to my pet robot. Legit. You know, you, you had people growing up before me, the baby boomers, they had the Jetsons. We got the Jetsons because I'm a Gen Xer. Do you not think that people of my age group would absolutely shit themselves to literally have C-3PO? We'd lose our minds. 
we would literally lose our minds because it would be everything come true that we ever thought was unachievable. It would be absolute amazing. Like if you tell the Astro to whistle happy, sing happy birthday, it'll whistle happy birthday for someone. But now I can't imagine if it could sing it and then it could also mimic someone else's tone. And it's doing that from the unit, not through Amazon Web Services, because then you don't have to care about Amazon Web Services. That's the most important thing. There's zero downtime, not statistically zero. There's zero downtime. And that's the problem with current AI models that rely on things like Watson or the supercomputers. If the Internet goes down, it goes from being a, um, a chess grandmaster to a damn paperweight instantaneously. But once it can have that knowledge back on the board, dude, it's going to be nuts. I've seen automated lawnmowers in Leesburg. Yeah, I've seen advertise, uh, advertisements for them on, um, on whatchamacallit, on uh, YouTube. I've seen those things pop up on there. And I suppose that great, but you still have to clean the foolish thing. Um, you have the better Daisy collection. <laughs> uh, I still do not see alkaline hydrolysis replacing flame. Not anytime soon. The moment it will replace flame, Professor Beckham, is the moment that you can hydrolyze regularly more than one person in the chamber because now it becomes competitive with flame because you can finally have that level of speed. Uh, and the other problem is you cannot gimmick a hydrolysis unit. If it's rated for 250 pounds, you cannot put 400 pounds in it. There's no way to make that happen. You can do that on a flame unit. If you know what you're doing, which you should if you've gone through mortuary school because we're now all using standardized textbooks based on the Cremation Association of North America's safe operator training, which was then parroted by NFDA, ICC, FFA, and everyone of the hell else out there. All of that science is now mainstream. Turn the machine on, light it up. As soon as you see combustion start, turn off the afterburner. Give it around an hour, hour and a half, turn the thing back on, let the afterburner Hit it again. Let it ignite whatever oils are pooling. As soon as you see the combustion on the temperature chart, turn it back off and keep doing this until you reduce the weight to something manageable. And then you can turn the machine on and treat it like normal. You can literally sit there and do 600 pounds in a unit that's rated only for 200, completely safe with no issues if you know what you're doing. You put 600 pounds in a hydrolyzer meant for 200 pounds, the machine won't even start. It can't handle it. So then you're going to have to um, disarticulate the body into pieces and hydrolyze it bit by bit, which that's just dumb. Uh, well, demand will increase for alkaline hydrolysis, but it will not replace flame. Yeah, no. And the technology, again, it, it can't. It cannot do the same exact thing. Uh, Kenyon, she wanted to turn Cape Cod. Kenny, big man. What's up, bro? Dan Chain will turn Cape Cod College into uh, an MCI in Bumble with Bay, by all means. If that means you get bodies, experience is experience, bro. Take it what you can. And I still like that picture of seeing him in your jacket. God damn, that was funny. Um, <clears throat> thank you for everyone going to hit the bed. Later on, Squid, fair winds following seed. See when you get to the state side. Stay safe. Uh, how would we get frozen bodies for labs most of the time? Yeah, our morgues kick in and we, they turn into corpsicles. Uh, what would you propose to break up the ice and improve drainage and distribution? There, there's nothing you can really do except wait it out. Like, th there's nothing. So the, the way we combat here in Miami is we, as soon as the first person comes in in the, uh, the, the, in the office in the morning, the admin just goes right back, pulls out the bodies, and immediately they start thawing out. And then uh, I suppose if you have to go and there's still got some like ice going on in there, then just follow the rules of the textbook. Use warm water. Okay, use warm water. Inject as soon as you can raise an artery. And you have to do damn near waterless if you're, if you're, because you, you, you got to add something in there to warm things up. Damn near waterless, high index chemicals because as that ice melts, it's going to create more water that you're going to have to deal with. And then slow and steady wins the race. Don't go in there at standard 20 PSI at a rate of flow of 25 to 30. It's not going to work. Probably start at a creep. 
And I do all the bodies the same exact way. I set my pressure for whatever my pressure setting is. Me personally, I think my sweet spot is 60 PSI. Most people will probably think I'm nuts. But when I go to inject, I'm watching that little flow meter just start to move before I stop playing with it. And then when it stops moving, that's when I continue to turn it. And then once it gets to about two ounces per minute and stays there, I let it sit there until it bottoms out again. <clears throat> so the first 15 minutes of me embalming a body is literally just putting water in or putting solution in. And then the solution meets the ambient pressure of the body, the osmotic pressure of the body. And then I turn the rate of flow up a little bit higher again. So it pushes a little bit more so it can displace the water in front of it. And I literally keep doing that for the first 15 minutes until finally it stays at the two or the four, or whatever I'm injecting at. Because once it hits that, I know I've got return circulation. By that point, the slow saturation should have given me distribution everywhere that I want. And now after I start paying attention to where I'm seeing color, I can start modifying things. Dropping arms over the side, putting legs up, pivoting the table, doing whatever little massage I want. And I don't take drainage until the first gallon is in there. So I, the only time I ever do concurrent drainage is if I have anasarca. As soon as I see all the edema, that's when I open up. What a surprise. That's what your textbook says. So literally, I do exactly what Robert G. Mayer and Sharon G. Mascarello and all of their co-editors say, here's how you embalm a body. And again, what a surprise. It works pretty damn well. Uh, Kenny, huge fan. Listen to your embalming lectures weekly with Professor Shea. I'll be wearing your pin. I was going to say, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, I think you Facebooked me. Some said you, you finally got that pin. So if he didn't give it to you, I'd, I'd have to send you one. <clears throat> I said for a pinning summer. Cool. Make sure you tag me in a photo. Make sure you tag me in that photo on Thursday. I want to, I want to see, uh, I want to see you, uh, get pinned for that program. Professor Shea's cool as hell. I love Dan. Dan is so cool. Katrine, thank you. You're welcome, babe. Have a good night. Uh, Howard Beckham, an old bomber I worked with 20 years ago, dumped antifreeze into the tank. I mean, and probably most, it would not surprise me to find that ethylene glycol is in most of uh, most embalming chemicals in most catalogs, considering the fact that it's one of the things that's in most of our chemicals. I mean, the literally antifreeze is in there. So the problem is the antifreeze is not going to melt anything. The antifreeze in there is in there to act as a humectant. So what's probably happening when you inject something like that is exactly what your textbook says you don't want to do with humectants, which is put in so much humectant that it creates a, uh, a hyper concentration to pull moisture out. Um, like, you're not going to worry about freezing the body again. <laughs> I mean, you're just not at that point. Realistically, what you should probably do is just after you're done your initial injection, just look at it, maintain it, and then don't be afraid to do a section. Go into the legs and then do maybe a second shot uh, once the body's thawed out. Realistically, you want the body's as, as thawed as possible. Uh, the reason why you don't put the warm water on the body or try to like raise the body temp is because what ends up happening then you've defrosted the upper layers of the skin and the superficial tissues, which means decomposition is going to kick back in at the same exact time. All the underlying thick tissues underneath are still frozen, which means nothing's going on. So then you have decomposition happening on top, frozen crap underneath, and you have this nightmare situation where what are you going to do? Like if everything's frozen in the middle, you're not going to get that. There's like nothing you literally can do. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's just a nope for me. So let it thaw out. Turn the air conditioner on. Let it thaw out as long as you can. And if you if time is of the essence, as soon as you can raise that artery, immediately get in there with some warm, maybe seven or eight percent solution. Put like seven or eight bottles of. Uh, Interfiant, um, old time color with a dye of your choice, or interfiant with Dynachrome or Trauma Care with a dye, or Power Tone Vivid. Um, you know, I could go down all the high index lists, and 
just inject it at like eight or nine percent. And you don't have to worry about dehydrating it at that point because all that ice is going to melt anyways. So that's just more water sitting there that's going to try to mess with your uh, denatured protein. Strong argument could be made for re-injection the next day or something once everything thaws out. That way you're just kind of like sealing the deal. That's the fun about embalming is you do whatever you feel you want to, whatever you have the time for, and then look at the results later. Like if someone drags you in the court for doing that because you got someone that was basically a corpsicle, like good luck finding an expert witness that's going to say, well, here's what you do in that situation. I mean, I'm sure you probably got someone that's got like 20 or 30,000 bodies under the belt, like a Jack Adams or a Matt Smith or a Monica Torres. But, you know, if I'm going up against one of those high level pros, my first question, how many frozen bodies have you done? Not how many autopsies or how many total. How many people that confuse themselves as a rocket pop have you embalmed? And then the next question is going to be, and what level of variability do you think that all you different pros are going to have? So I couldn't tell you that even if I wanted the money, I'd even take an expert witness case like that just because of the level of <clears throat> personal autonomy that you could get on how to solve that problem. But where just about everyone ends up problemed in, uh, in court is they go in, they do what the book said, they put in the warm uh, water with a 7% solution, and then they stop. They don't do anything past that. Now that's your problem. Because there is literally nowhere in the book that it says that once you're done arterially preserving the body, you just get off the can because you're done. You have to observe the body for the entire period of storage until funeralization. And you take whatever steps that you need to take to secure the preservation of the body, whether it's sectional injection, topical injection with uh, cauterant packs or inlays or um, uh, hypodermic injections. That is an absolute necessity on any case. And too many embalmers forget that, oh, I injected it, it looks good, and I'm done. Or I injected it, oh, this might go bad. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and put it back in the fridge. Well, guess what? Even if you put it back in the fridge, you're supposed to go take a peek at it at least every couple of days. I think the textbook recommends if you put it back in the fridge like every 48 or 72 hours, you should take a peek at it. If it's not in the fridge, you should look at it every day. It doesn't mean you put it back in the fridge on Monday, and you pull it back out on Friday and go, oh, shit, <laughs> looks like the legs got skin slipped. Huh. Well, that's just bad luck. No, it's you being stupid because you put it in the fridge knowing it. And that's the best part. That's what I love about being an expert witness is literally calling you stupid in front of people because you're stupid. You're literally stupid. Why'd you put it in the fridge? You embalmed it, but then you put it in the fridge. Why'd you put it in the fridge? <laughs> you put it in the fridge because you knew it wasn't going to last. And then what did you do? You left it in the fridge. You didn't even check it. And then now you're trying to say, and you have said under oath when we deposed you, you were surprised it turned out like that. You are literally too stupid to breed. My God in Himmel. Like, you're either lying or you're dumb. I can't make a statement as to which one it is. A lawyer can infer it in their arguments, maybe. But you can only be one of the two things. You're criminally stupid or you're lying. And you shouldn't be either of those if you're an embalmer. My God. That's what kills me. There's no middle ground. Y'all can try to change my mind on that. Feel free, any of you with the license want to try to change my mind that if you embalm someone and put it in the fridge, the only reason why anyone ever does that is because you know it ain't going to take. And you're worried it's not going to last. And you're usually too cheap to want to do a surface embalming. <laughs> oh, my God. <clears throat> Put this back before I literally stab myself. God, that'd be funny, wouldn't it? I have to pull the live stream early because I have a... Uh...
We've got to go to uh, urgent here. Kelly, how are you? Uh, what's your favorite suggestion to prep for national boards? Learn to read and write. That's usually good. Uh, outside of that, um, so uh, dead program. So uh, full disclosure, I know Dr. David Pennington, the State University of New York at Canton, who is the uh, guy that owns the Death Education Assessment Drills uh, MBE Exam Simulator. I'm familiar with his website. I've used his product, et cetera. Um, David's product is a good product, but it is only one thing to use. And this is where, um, just for the record, folks, I'm no longer, I mean, I think I'm a member of some of those NBE study groups or NBE prep. I've unfollowed them. Uh, I think I've taken myself out of those groups. I'm just tired of it. Um, too many people think it's the end all. If I do the dead simulator, I'm going to pass. No, you're not. Okay. And that's, that's the wrong assumption to have. The most important thing to prepping for the national board exam is to drop the 65 or 70 bucks and buy the national board exam study guide. Okay. Now the international conference has been very kind because I recorded a video about a year and a half, two years ago, where I went through their study guide telling you folks how to prep for your board and how to use the study guide to prep for your boards. They didn't copyright strike me. They didn't ask for a removal of my video. Having said that, knock on wood, they're probably going to now. But at least there's a new edition of their study guide, so it's, you know, old material. But the principles are the same. And what you have to do is look at that study guide, read where the questions are coming from, look at the professional expectations, look at the content outline. And then as you're looking at your material. Ask yourself what you're reading. Does it fall into one of, or any of these categories? Which means you have to be very familiar with that study guide. Because you may be reading something in one book and you might say, well, wait a second. Hey, this sounds like something that I might have seen in the sciences section under this outline. And then when you flip over and you look at that again, you're like, oh, crap. So now you know that something that you didn't think might be in the sciences section or the arts section or whatever it's going to be, there's potential for that to be on there. Now, I am very guilty of telling people for years, I admit this, that the National Board Exam Study Guide is an absolute waste of goddamn money. I literally said that for years because I was stupid. I was criminally stupid. And I did not understand how to put these two things together. So me saying something is completely useless without having put some thought into that is big slap on me. And I still see people say, oh, that book's useless. No, the questions aren't worth it. Now, that's true. The questions aren't worth dog spit. But you're not buying it for the questions. You were never to buy that for the questions. You were there to buy that to see what is it that has the potential to be asked for these 60 questions, for these 22 questions, for these five questions. And then go to the next one. What are they going to ask in these 22, these 18, these 16? So then you have an idea. So a lot of people go in there and they start tearing up their chemistry book because, oh, my God, I sucked at chemistry. It's my hardest subject. How much of the stuff are you looking at in that study guide have, has a basis in chemistry? This is not a, a trade secret, okay? This is in their study guide. This is something that you can buy that's available right now from their website and school bookstores. So I'm not letting out the bag on any of this. The two places I see the most chemistry, general cervix sciences and the embalming domains. That's it. So looking at the embalming domain, and I don't remember how many questions are in the embalming section. I think it's like 57 or 60 or something because it was updated in January. But we'll say for the sake of argument, there's 60 in there. One, absolutely factually true statement. There are no 60 damn questions on chemistry on a board exam ever, ever, ever. Okay? Never. I'm absolutely positive 
that there has never in the history of the national board exam been 60 chemistry questions to take up the entirety of the embalming section. Because for the love of Christ, that would defeat the entire purpose of having an embalming section. So they're not going to do that. And that would cause huge problems because I'd love to see them try to say that their exam is legally defensible when it literally says embalming, but you did nothing but ask chemistry. Like, bro. Okay. No way. There's no way that anyone in their exam committee is that stupid. So how much time are you going to spend knowing that anatomy, micro, path, and chemistry are part of the 20 questions of uh, funeral service sciences, and chemistry is also going to be part of the embalming for 60 questions? And if your answer is you're studying more chemistry than embalming, you shouldn't be. Doesn't mean don't look at it. You certainly want to maximize your chances of getting a question right. But you can't be hammering that. Second thing, when professors, anybody tells you, here's what you write in your note page. Here's what you put in your scrap paper. You are practicing writing on the whiteboard for your national board exam. So I tell people all the time, if you feel that you are going to get questions on how to name compounds. You might get a question on a board exam that has to do with what do you call a carbon chain that has um, seven carbons and a double bond. Now, does the question exist? I don't know if it does. All I can tell you is I didn't write one if it does. And I guess for some disclosure, I don't, I can't imagine that something like that exists. But let's say for the sake of argument, that, that 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 question is out there in some way, shape, or form, because it could be there because it is one of the accessible areas. Daylene, please don't sue me too much, okay? Um, I tell everyone in my chemistry classes, here's what you put in your whiteboards. Meth, F, prop, but, pent, uh, hex, hept, oct, non, dec. Left side of the uh, of your scratch paper. Right side of the scratch paper. Ain, een, ein, il. Single bond, double bond, triple bond, side chain. So SB, single bond, DB, double bond, uh, TB, triple bond, SC, side chain. What do I have? One to 10 on one side, bonds on the other. And it just told me that I need seven, hept, double bond, en, no side chains. I'm looking at heptene. I'm not guessing. And I've written this down on every piece of scratch paper in every class I've ever taken since then. So if I'm in accounting, I get my accounting, I get my scratch paper, I immediately write down the stuff I want to practice. I've taken restorative art, I immediately draw my color wheel, I put in all my abbreviations. So in the chance that they might ask me about a complement or a double complementary or whatever, I got the wheel in my face and I can just go right across and look at stuff. And every time you sit down to do the scratch paper, you write the same exact thing. So by the time you literally sit down on a board exam, the first Three minutes, five minutes, you're sitting there pounding it. Now, I don't know if Dr. Evely's still here, but Dr. Evely is a lawyer. Dr. Evely went to law school, passed the bar exam, brilliant dude. And I'm willing to bet, if he's still listening, Mark, please tell them if I am lying. When you take a board prep course, a bar prep course, I'm sorry, a bar prep course, a good portion of that course and a good portion of the stuff you learn in law school is when you sit down to do, especially the essay portion of the uh, multi-state bar exam, the moment you see the topic that you are looking at, the first thing you do is you outline. And the only way to outline your argument for that essay is to remember all the stuff that actually goes into that legal area because you can't possibly dump, you can't walk into the bar exam for the essay and immediately start writing down a constitutional law outline. You can't just start writing down a criminal law or a civ pro or tort or contract or whatever it is. You can't start writing things down until you literally look at the essay to see what it's asking about. So you read the question at the bottom of the word of, of the essay problem, and then you start reading from the top. So the first thing is, what are they asking you about? Because you only want to limit the essay to what it is that they're asking. And then from there, you go to the top and you start reading the essay down so you can see what area of law am I working in and what are my limitations? Because in legal essays from law school, 
they might put a limitation in the paragraph. Don't talk about the ex-wife. Talk about this relationship right here and only this between these two parties. And then immediately the first 10 minutes that you spend after you've read the scenario, the first 10 minutes, the only thing that you do is you sit there with your scratch paper and you outline your essay. You immediately start writing down all the things that you can remember about that tort, about that crime, about that procedure, about the requirements, about the exceptions, about everything. And then once you've got that outline done, immediately you start typing it in. And you should finish that thing within the last 10 to 15 minutes. The last five to 10 minutes of your essay is you simply going through and double checking and making sure everything adds up. You always use your scratch paper. Always. So get in the habit of doing that now. And get in the habit of doing something for arts and doing something for sciences. There's no need to draw the color wheel on in arts. There's no need to worry about assets equals liabilities plus capital on your sciences. But you may want to practice that while you're in school to get used to writing these things down. And then maybe in capstone or more compliance or professional review or whatever the review class you take is called, you start specifically writing things down for the different types of tests. You'll probably find that that helps a lot. Um, but dead program, it keeps you disciplined. The problem that people have is you think that once you graduate mortuary school, that you split off. Oh, I'm going to take my boards in six months. One, that's, that's the biggest mistake you've already made. In six months, you're not going to remember half of what you remember now. Ideally, you finish your finals on Friday. You're taking your board on Saturday. Literally get the hell in there. Get in as quickly as possible. The longer you wait to take your boards, the longer you have to stay at the same peak performance level that got you through capstones or mortgage compliance or whatever the hell it's called. No one wants to do that for six months. No one can do that for six months. You start burning out. You start cutting corners. You start only doing this. You have to stay on top of it. So the dead simulator fills in a very important niche that it allows you to sit there and run questions, especially from the internet, especially from a mobile device, wherever you are, so you can make the maximum use of downtime. That's what the dead simulator is good for. So if you use the tool for the right purposes, it's a very effective tool. But too many people go in there that I see on Facebook thinking that, oh, these are the questions of the board exam. What part of you're never going to see questions on your board exam in real life outside of the board exam? And if they catch you doing it, they're going to uncertify your result. You get to take the board exam again. You don't want to put yourself in that position. Uh, L. Kipper getting ready to take the sciences portion. This is very helpful. Good. That way it wasn't a waste of your time. You should be studying. <coughs> uh, I kind of feel that way too about the dead. I feel there's more besides these questions. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. So I, I don't know how much I can talk about when it comes to the board exam, for, for disclosure purposes, I've served as an item writer for the national board exam. I, do, I don't believe the internet, the international conference will have a huge problem with me saying the following statement. If they do, they'll let me know and never say it again, and I'll delete the video later. When they advertise in the proper circles for item writers, which a call goes out and people sign up to be item writers, and it's licensed professionals, that can include professors. The one thing that they, all the item writers have in common, they all have licenses. They're all funeral directors, they're all embalmers. They all have licenses. And I believe they're all dual licensed. So they're not just funeral directors only, I think. They might be, I wasn't really paying attention to the criteria, I gotta be honest. Um, but I'm willing to bet the majority of them are dual licensed. It's not like two people. They don't do item writers, just get like two people. They get a bunch of people, like 30, 40, 50 people. And according to their need, they get however many warm bodies they need to write questions. And these people are going to generate some questions. And if they do this every year, so I am not going to tell you a number that is real, okay? 
if they get 50 people and they tell those 50 people you're going to write 25 questions, well, you do the math of how many questions those people are going to generate in one year, in that one sitting. And if they do this literally every year, again, you do the math. How many questions are they getting every year? You will never get ahead of them. You will literally never get ahead of them. And I take my NDAs and the things that I promise when they, when they allow me to do stuff very seriously. I do think some disclosure and some transparency is fine. I don't think I've said anything that they're going to be pissed off at me about. But I promise you, when I write something for the national board exam, I never bring it up in my classes. I know there are people that probably might do that. But when I said that I this is your property, I want nothing to do with it, I literally, if the International Conference ever contacted a federal law enforcement uh, bureau, because if I am messing with them, it's going to be a federal case. Like the, that we're across state, there's so many ways this becomes federal law issue. I want them to come in and search my computer and spend all that money and not find a damn thing. Absolutely, I want them to. I think that'd be the funniest thing on earth. Y'all went through all that hassle and you literally didn't find shit. I am that level of troll. But I am also a man of my word. If they say, hey, if you write it, you can't use it again. And you can't do hint, hint, wink, wink. I'm not going to do it. Because if I do a hint, hint, wink, wink, what's my, literally, what are my students going to think? Oh, I'm going to see this question on a board exam. No, you're likely never going to see that question. You don't even know if that question got okay for a deployment. So it literally serves no purpose whatsoever for me to disclose anything about any questions I've written or I've seen or anything like that, because it does a disservice. The only statement that I can make for any of you taking the national board exam Study everything. Read their study guide. Look at where things fall. As you are reading the material, as you're going through your books, ask yourself, how can this be used against me? Are there terms like what I'm seeing here that can be confusing against other terms? And if the answer is yes, hey, this looks really similar to this other term, chances are pretty damn good that item writers know that too. And what are we going to do? We're going to put confusing terms that are similar as A, B, C, D, E's. So you really have to know what something is. But if you know all three and four of these things are together and you've already been practicing that, that's probably the most important thing that I can tell you. Is that as you're looking at the material, chart things out, especially similar words. See what the fine differences are between them. That's especially true for some of the gen ed stuff like small business management, where there are so many terms that can be very, very, very similar. So that way, if you do get something like that placed side by side, you're not getting wrecked. Uh, Howard, learning the subject matter is key. Knowing how to read the questions to understand. <coughs> yeah, exactly. Learning the subject matter. And what's the best way to learn the subject matter? Memorization, side-by-side uh, -side comparisons, why I, I encourage people to do charts. And the next thing, the most important thing, get with the study buddy. Gym buddies are important. Study buddies are important. In fact, funny, th funny story, true story. I got a Facebook message from my mortuary school study buddy two days ago to ask me a question about Florida law. Not the first question I've gotten him in like 15 years, but still he gets a question. One of the first people he thinks to ask is me. Now he knows I'm in mortuary science education. He knows that, you know, somehow or another, I remember how to rub two sticks together to make smoke. So <clears throat> he knows to reach out. But he's still my study buddy, man. And if it wasn't for him, I'll tell you right now, if it wasn't for Pastor Tom Monroe, I probably still would have never graduated mortuary school. But it's because of him keeping me honest, 
and getting together right before we go in for midterms and stuff like that so we can go over topics together talking on the phone so we didn't have FaceTime or Facebook Messenger or any of that crap. Dude, he's literally the reason why I passed. Not because he told me answers. Literally, him and I just working on the material. And I spent easy 30 to 40 hours a week studying, in addition to working at my funeral home. If you were to find my ex-girlfriend at the time, and she's married living in England, she will literally tell you that I was never anywhere, even when I was hanging out with her, that I wasn't studying. I wasn't thinking about mortuary science, right? I didn't have no cards or something somewhere on my body. So if I was just sitting there, I drove out, just pick out a card and start looking. Literally everywhere I went, I was studying. Had to. Agreed, that's how I got through the arts. May not be cool, but study the glossaries and the study guides too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Knowing the terms. Absolutely. Great advice. Well, I guess you should have listened, huh? <laughs> We've averaged about, uh, I, think the, I think the most I've seen was 12 or 13 people, and right now we got eight. So th th this has been going good. And every time I'm done one of my little, like, infantile rants, there's usually more stuff to talk about. I think I finally got to the bottom of the chat. I'm still pissed, for those of you here first, I'm still pissed I couldn't get that studio thing to run. Because legit, I was going to, like, pull stuff up and, like, do things on the screen and demonstrate some stuff. And because I couldn't get the stupid studio running, uh, I can't literally do any of that because I'm using the generic uh, Facebook um, which I'm gonna call it the generic Facebook interface. Ooh, open commission meeting for the Federal Trade Commission on May 18th. What are they talking about? Uh, policy statement on biometric information of the FTC. Okay, well, we don't really care. Uh, health breach notification rule. That ought to be a fun one. FTC privacy. Yeah, who cares? Dude, who's on the commission now? <coughs> about the FTC. Who's left? Uh, commissioners, you know, uh, I'm not a fan of Lena Khan, who's the current chair. Um, I think she was an appointee under, uh, Barack Obama. I think we lost the Trumper. I, th I think the one that we got in there, I know 2021. So she's a, she's a Biden appointee. Dude, they still haven't replaced the two that are missing. Yo, someone get on the phone and call Joe Biden. Tell him to do his job, would you? <laughs> they, so one had retired right as the uh, they were discussing the, um, whatchamacallit, uh, the FTC funeral rule back in October, I think it was. One had just stepped down, and then the other one was a woman that was appointed by, um, uh, what's his name, um, President Trump. Because there should be five people, and they're down to three. So, uh, Biden. Oh, is she a Trumper? Commissioner Slaughter? I think she's a Trumper. No. Yes? Yeah, she's a... Okay, so she's still on there. Okay. Uh, this may be premature, but after the boards would be a good way to prepare for the state exams. I'm in Florida in an internship right now. Uh, I want to get it knocked out right after the boards. Um, <coughs> so uh, Dr. Pennipin, through the death education assessment drills, he actually every so often uh, contracts me to do a Florida law review. So that's one option if you want to do that. Uh, in the upcoming months, there may be some other options as well. In, re in regards to like test simulators and stuff like that for the Florida laws, um, if you're if you're on the YouTube channel, something like that, I'm I'm sure I'll post something or whatever uh, to let people know when these other uh, tools come up, up up and running. But the Florida laws are obscene. Uh, I know you might want to dive in as soon as your boards are out, but if you haven't looked at the Florida laws, to <laughs> when you do, just. <laughs> You'll, you'll know why I'm laughing. Um, <clears throat> you will probably put more effort into studying for the Florida Laws and Rules exam than you ever did for most of your boards, honest to God, just because it's an obscene amount of information. 
and you only get 50 questions. Most important advice I have about Florida laws and rules, though, if, well, when you take your Florida laws and rules exam, and if you fail it, one, don't let it get in your head, because I think they said they're, Howard remind me, their pass rate's like 50%, like 40-something, 50-something. I think um, Mary Schwantes, the executive director of the, uh, or the director of the uh, Division of Funeral Cemetery and uh, Consumer Services, I think mentioned at one of the meetings a couple of months ago that she um, that the pass rate's like either just under or just about 50%. I think that actually is high, but okay. Um, you can review the exam. Can't do that with a national board exam, but you can review your Florida laws and rules exam and absolutely do so if you fail it. I think most people screw up and don't go back and just look at the exam, see what the right answers were, then go back and schedule a new attempt and keep on studying. I know some people it takes like five attempts to pass, but I know the people that took it for like five times, it wasn't until the third time they had talked to me and I said, well, you we went back and looked at it, right? And they didn't realize that they could. And then as soon as they did, now all of a sudden, two attempts later, they pass and life is good. So um, keep that in mind, that you can review the Florida Laws and Rules exam. And I strongly encourage you to do that. I can tell you, I was scared shitless of that exam. Like, the boards can suck it. The Florida Laws and Rules exam, I almost had a panic attack over that exam because of the sheer amount of stupid that you have to study. And all of it's law, so that means none of it is interesting. It's not like the boards where, hey, you like studying funeral directing, you like studying embalming or something like that. There's nothing redeeming about the Florida laws. It's just all boring. Sex and advice and no. Yeah, it's, uh, I think, so they charge you $15. If you go to myfloridacfo.com, choose the division website, go to the Florida Laws and Rules Exam Study Materials page they have. You can send them like a check for like 10 bucks or 15 bucks and they'll send you all the printed materials. It's literally worth it because if you were to like download these as PDFs and go to like FedEx and try to print them, you would spend at least that much money just on the paper. Like it's dumb. It's dumb how big these things are. Um, there's at least 200 pages of paper. But yeah, pass your boards first. You don't want to try to be studying both of those. There's just no way. Professor Beckham, were you scared of that exam too? Like when you started studying for it? I can ask you because I know you're Florida licensed. you have an example of a question of the Florida laws test? I do not have any, any, um, I do not have any examples. And even if I did, I would not disclose that I did because under Florida law, chapter 497, it is a third degree felony to share any questions of a standardized exam in the state of Florida. I could literally lose my civil rights and go to prison for up to five years with a fine of, I think, $10,000. Don't believe me? It's chapter 497. They don't want us talking about questions. Not asking you to just like the wording. What do you think the wording is? <laughs> <laughs> so they can ask you a question literally about anything in Chapter 497, 69K, 64V, 733, um, 308, I think it is. I can't remember. I, I could pull it up here. Right? I got this. Uh, give me a second here. I've got my little cheat sheet over here. So, uh, 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 where the hell is it? There we go. All right, drag that right there, drag this right here. So on the Florida State Laws and Rules exam, if you buy their, uh, their study guide, this is the cover page. Uh, 50 questions, one hour. You are asked questions on Chapter 497, Florida Statutes. 69K, which is the Florida Administrative Code that supplements 497. You can be asked on 406, which has to do with medical examiners. 
chapter 11G, which is the supplement for chapter 406 for that, 382, which is vital statistics, and 64V, which is the uh, associated code for 382. You have chapter 406, uh, part two, Florida statute. So at least they give you like a little bit of a breakdown here. Uh, and then they also give you some very specific United States Code and Code of Federal Regulation stuff. Uh, I wouldn't beat up the, the CFR and the USC too much because, like, maybe it's one question, maybe two on the whole exam. Uh, and if you have to retake it because you forgot those, then, you know, OF and well. Um, but, like, 497. 497, they can ask you how many people c can make up the, the Board of Funeral Cemetery and Consumer Services. They might they, they have the potential of asking you um, who are those individuals? How long are they appointed? What is the process for their appointment? Who appoints them? Who confirms them? Uh, if there's costs associated, renewals uh, for licensure, initial licensure, et cetera, literally anything in the law can be asked. So you're studying everything. And I can tell you. In 69K, just 69K Florida Administrative Code, the definitions are like 152 terms, not including the definitions of 497, 406, 11G, 382, and 64B. So you're looking at a glossary. If you want to put this in perspective, the embalming glossary of the American Board of Funeral Service Education has around 380 terms. The embalming glossary for the entire topic you have just as many definitions from across. You have 200 at least just on 497 to 69K. It's an obscene amount of information. And then on top of that, you have to memorize all the other garbage. Like some of it, you should know some things about, like when you have to have death certificates in. Because if you're working and you're interning, you know when you have to have uh, death certificates registered and how long people have to sign and push buttons and stuff like that. So you're around it. That should be some easy stuff. But then it comes to you get worried because what type of random, dumb, obscure bullshit are they going to ask you about? And that's when you just like really start getting panicked over it. And I found this exam harder than my real estate exam because I'm a licensed real estate salesperson. So I had to do the 60 hour um, pre-license course, take an exam, take my licensure exam, and then a 40 hour post-license course. Um, and I already had experience taking a Florida standardized exam. So I kind of knew the bullshit that they could like really split some hairs or what type of computations they could ask you to do. Uh, when I came into this, I went into this with that mentality. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is so much crap, because at least in real estate. There's usually like a pattern or a structure there. There's no there, there's very few patterns, if any. When it comes to like the fee breakdowns and stuff like that, the only thing good is the majority of renewal dates are all the same. So like if you memorize like when the preemie people have to have their stuff in or licensed funeral director versus a combination funeral director and bomber versus an embalmer only, pretty much all of our licenses expire on like August 31st. So you don't have like these staggered whatevers, but there is some staggering where certain like preemie is on one schedule uh, licensed funeral directors are on another, and then facility things might be on different dates. So you are learning like three different dates for when licenses expire, when uh, things are due and stuff like that. It's pretty crazy. Hope you get the state. Yeah, uh, Howard, are you going to be up there on um, June 8th when they have the uh, the exam committee meeting? I confirm with Mayor, I'm going to be there for that. I'm going to be there for that meeting. Uh, do not forget federal. Yeah, the, the, I mean, <clears throat> when, you, when you get the breakdown, though, like that's one of the things I, I, I have to temper. There's a lot of paper. There's a lot of paper for the U.S. codes and for the Code of Federal Regulations, but it's only like one question on the exam. So, again, it comes down to, and that's where I think people screw up, where do you put the bulk of your time? Yeah, read through the United States Code like once every day or every other day or so. Yeah, read through Code of Federal. Maybe do USC on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and do CFR on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. But I would never spend the amount of time studying the United States Code or the Code of Federal Regulation versus studying 497 and 69K. 
Like if you look at the outline, 40 to 50% of the questions will come from 497 and 69K in regards to practice laws. 16 to 20% also come from those same two chapters only on pre-need, right? So that means worst case scenario, half the exam only comes from 497 and 69K. Best case scenario, 70% of the questions come from those two chapters. So you are literally the dumbest person on earth and shouldn't ever get a license if you don't spend the absolute bulk of your time studying 497 and 69K. Because up to three quarters of your exam can come from just those two chapters. You are literally reading those chapters, that those laws every day of the week until you take the exam. And then from that, you start supplementing. The medical examiner, the vital stuff, the disposition stuff, the U.S. code. Again, you know, th th this is the war of attrition. If you focus on the 70% of the exam and you fail by one or two questions and you go back and you look at the exam, yes, it was like a $280 mistake. But then you're going to see exactly the stuff that you got wrong. And if it came from the U U.S. codes or the Code of Federal Regulation, chances are pretty good. No one's writing a hell of a lot of questions on those because that's not the majority of the questions you're going to get. So then it's just a war of attrition. How many times you're going to go in before you've literally seen enough that your chances of passing the test are just going to raise higher and higher. And people that do that usually pass by the second or third attempt, providing you're going back and looking. But you certainly don't want to not study for this. Go in, look at the exam, and think you're going to get the same 50 questions. That's not going to happen. Uh... Forty-three thousand five hundred sixty square foot per acre. What does that have to do with? That, that is that just some random fact you wanted to throw on, <laughs> just to break up the chat so and be like, "WTF, dude?" <laughs> now, the, the, you know, a, a, a good question, like a question that might come up that they could ask on the exam that makes perfect sense. Is there a minimum sizes in the state of Florida for our establishments? And I want to say the minimum size of a funeral home, uh, a licensed funeral establishment under Florida statute is like 1,250 square foot. That's the minimum size square footage you must have in order to be licensed as a funeral home. And if you don't have the minimum square footage, you can't even apply for the license. I think direct disposers is like 650 or something like that. And I made a presentation years ago for consumers so that people can put this in perspective. 1250 is the size of a Starbucks. Roughly a, a normal Starbucks store is right around 1,200 to 1,500 square foot. So if you walk in there, that's the minimum square footage you need for a funeral home in the state of Florida. A direct disposer was a checkers. Literally, the real estate under the ceiling, that's the minimum size you need to have as a direct disposer. You can't even fit a retort in that small area. It's crazy. But those are things they can ask you about in addition to any of the definitions, in addition to the compass. I mean, there is so much in the law that's crazy. I'm not a broker. I'm a salesperson. I never got my broker's license. Oh, that's right. For, uh, yeah, so how many square foot per in an acre? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we actually had to memorize that for, for state of Florida. I, I think that what they really nail us with is they like to ask math questions about computing taxes and exemptions uh, and stuff like that. Like they want us to be able to sit there and know what type of, what, what a person's property tax liability is going to be after you do certain things and what people under HUD can do versus non HUD and stuff like that. <clears throat> uh, Maddie says 205 for a concurrent internship application. Shit, man. I wish that was uh, I wish that was the full license. I think full license for um for a light for a funeral director and bomber i want to say that's like what 655 755 now it's something stupid it's like it's an obscene amount of money and the only reason why the concurrent intern is so cheap is because the the testing fee is not part of that the testing fee is built in the uh the full license it's the it's nuts we are some of the most expensive uh license renewals in the united states
Yeah, I, I'm starting to get like panic attack thinking about that damn Florida. It's one of the reasons why I just never want to lose my uh, my funeral license, honest to God, or my real estate license. I never want to take those exams again. Like the state licensure exams, they can literally burn in hell. Did not enjoy that experience at all. I was going to say my cough is going away, but I can feel it like creeping up as soon as I see that I start like choking or something. Yeah, I haven't used my, I haven't used my real estate license since 1999, I think. Uh, how often do I do Q&A? Um, actually, the person to blame for this one was uh, Dr. Mark Evely up at Wayne State University, the chair of uh, the, uh, of their uh, program up there. I think actually he's a dean and a chair. I can't remember. Him. He's got so much stuff in his like his byline that I can't remember. <laughs> and uh, he actually asked me, hey, when are you going to do another one? I was like, you know what? I probably need to schedule one of those. So I'm actually thinking about maybe doing these every two weeks going forward. Uh, like second, uh, second Friday and like fourth Fridays. Uh, because I, I have some software and crap I want to try. And I think the best way that I can do this is just by like literally doing it. So I'll probably start doing this about every two weeks. Um, do I chat over email? Yes, is the short answer. Uh, if someone sends me an email to one of my educator addresses, um, I will generally respond to those. If you send me to something like to anything that's registered with YouTube or whatever, I got to be honest, I never check those. Uh, I think I have my my YouTube um, email linked to my email on this computer, and I might have it linked to my workstation here in Miami. But I don't um, I don't go in there every day. Like if you email me there, when I check it, I check it. If it comes to like my Miami email address or something like that, then that's my work email. That populates to my phone, and I get everything. So I, I don't mind answering like a couple questions here and there, but as for like blowing up my email, like every day with five to 10 questions, at some point in time, you probably see that I'm ghosting you because day job. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Facebook messenger, people can Facebook message me. But again, if you, if you email me, if you, if you message me like five, six, seven times, 11 o'clock, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., something like that, don't be surprised if you get blocked and not responded to at some point because this doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> uh, Snapchat, Snapchat's also a thing. Uh, I think I'm on Snapchat. Maybe I'm on Snapchat. I got rid of like most of my social media stuff. So um, yeah, I'm on Snapchat. I'm on Snapchat. Uh, I think you can think I got an Instagram account. And I'm debating opening up a Discord. <sighs> Andres, high professor, is wondering why can a poorly maintained mausoleum be considered a public nuisance that a public, uh, sorry, public nuisance rather than a public health disturbance? So why would a state consider a public nuisance rather than a public health disturbance? Um, that might have something to do with who is able to declare a public nuisance versus a public health disturbance. Uh, and likely it qualifies for both. So the first thing is, a, from a private, and again, I'm not a licensed attorney, I'm not licensed to practice law, and I'm, nothing I say should constitute legal advice. Let's put that out there. Um, from a, I like to scratch and sniff stickers in my legal dictionary, uh, rudimentary legal education. I would probably think that proving a public nuisance is legally easier, right? Because then I don't have to prove the health aspect of it. It's just quicker. Um, so my mausoleum is falling apart, right? I got roaches. I got rats. I got all that crap. What if I don't have the rats? What if I just have bugs? Now, we, I live in Florida. Like, roaches is a way of life. If you don't want to deal with roaches, do not, under any circumstances, move to Florida. <clears throat> if I do not have like seeping fluids coming out of a mausoleum, I might have actually trouble saying that I have a public health disturbance because there is nothing that threatens health. You can be fugly as hell and not threaten health. There are ugly people out there. 
And they may hurt your feelings, but they're not going to cause your eyes to melt. They decide to go ahead and like spray formaldehyde uh, vapor as a cologne. Much different story. Now we're de definitely dealing with a public health disturbance and you're fugly, so it's a double win. Now with the uh, public nuisance, that can just be you look fugly, and I don't want to deal with you, and I and I and I can just bam do it. So I would probably say that's why. Uh, interesting history lesson. Interesting history lesson. When you go to law school, one of the first crimes that you uh, study is you study the crime of sodomy from way back in the day. And the reason why you study that crime is because it gives you the evolution of how law changes over time when people try to do things, especially lawyers trying to like pad up their, um, their wins over their losses. And in the late 1800s, you had murderers going to prison, not for murder, but for sodomy. Because it was easier to prove sodomy than it ever was to prove murder. So they choose crimes they can actually win. A great example of this is um, the award-winning Nobel Peace Laureate George Zimmerman uh, when he tussled with and um, killed Trayvon Martin. At the time, the Florida Attorney General uh, was a woman by the name of Pam Bondi. And I still think she's one of the dumbest people that has ever lived because just looking at the circumstances around the whole George Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin situation, I can tell you with certainty, 95% of all first year law students, 95% of all first year law students who have completed their first year, which is basically where you take criminal law would be able to tell you there was never a chance that Zimmerman was getting first-degree murder. Not ever. Not ever. Not ever. Not ever. And you're a dumbass for trying. It's not politically good. The optics aren't that great. But your option is, do you press a crime you know you can win, or do you press a crime trying to be tough and show that you, quote-unquote, care about a community? So what ended up happening is they um, they accused George Zimmerman of first degree murder. And they lost it miserably, like pathetically, horribly. First year law student has done better jobs at mock trial than the attorney general of the state of Florida's prosecution team did in this case. And it was so embarrassing. It was so embarrassing because they went so far to even try to be like, well, uh, you know, uh, the last minute here. Uh, We'll go ahead and we'll just settle for 10 years in prison. And the defense attorney's like, I, I'm not as dumb as you. Like, I, I, I wasn't drinking Sherwin-Williams and sniffing acetone when I went to law school. Uh, we'll, we'll just wait for the judge to decide what's going on here. And unsurprisingly, failed. And the problem is when you screw something up like that, and you don't also tack in like second-degree murder and other things on top of that, you've lost your opportunity to do it. State can't go back and say, yeah, sorry about that. We, we came after you for the wrong crime. So, uh, yeah, now we're going to do it for realsies. Uh, that's kind of how our justice system doesn't work. So, um, and the whole reason why is they, they wanted to get a murder one conviction. If they would have put him under second degree murder, his ass might be getting out of prison by now. Maybe. And absolutely that would have dealt out. Like that probably would have never made it to court. Because... The likelihood of getting a second-degree murder charge was probably upwards 90 to 95 percent, if not a guaranteed thing. Like, so much easier. So you pick and choose the laws you know you can actually enforce sometimes based on what a definition of that law is. If you don't meet the definition, you have a problem. I was reading with some interest uh, the defamation case against the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, he just got convicted in, uh, I'm sorry, he didn't get convicted. He was uh, found to have defamed and sexually assaulted someone in New York. And I can't say that I paid attention to the, uh, to the trial with any interest because anything that gives him publicity, I'm not really interested in. But when I look at the court case itself, 
I'm rather concerned. And I think anyone who believes in concepts of justice should be very concerned because, and I'm not making this up. Like I'm legit not making this up. And I know there's certain things I can't say on YouTube. I already said the SA word once. That's probably going to get this like banned. Um, the evidence in that case is pretty scary. Like not from a, hey, this guy needs to go to prison standpoint. It's pretty scary that, bro, you ran with this going to court and you changed laws to eliminate a statute of, limita of limitations and then brought it to court with this weak ass sauce. Oof. This is pretty dangerous. When you do stuff like that, it opens up the door for both sides to do crazy stuff. And um, I listened to a couple of different pundits, people on both sides, left and right, to see what they had to say about it. I don't mean like CNN, MSNBC. I mean like actual lawyers discussing cases and discussing what's going on here. And um, <clears throat> I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared at what they did. Because I don't think it's very wise to conveniently create laws to live statute of limitations and then still put something in that really is pretty weak where you don't have a lot. I mean, there's really some stuff there that scares me. I'll, I'll let you folks go delving into that if you want to look at it. But um, I never thought I would actually say this, but... I really do think that the former president needs to appeal that because, wow, if that's the type of stuff they can get away with in civil court going forward, I'm a little scared of what normal citizens are going to get nailed with um, in regards to defamation going forward because it's pretty lightweight. Like, it's very lightweight. You know, what's that smell? <laughs> oh my god yeah pretty much um <clears throat> and again if it smells bad this ain't the, this ain't the 1600s man this ain't like the, the, the this ain't the cemeteries over in england it's the, the smell the the smell's not a problem just because it smells bad doesn't mean it's gonna make you sick now after leaking formaldehyde Different, completely different story. Wow, we've done two hours already. I'll keep going. I don't know if anyone else has got questions. We still, we've already, we've hung around uh, eight to 12 people the entire time. Just lost two. It's bedtime. <laughs> someone's uh, someone's uh, significant other or spouse wants to use a computer, so just kick them off. <laughs> I've not seen Guardians three yet. I've not seen Guardians three yet. Um, I will probably try to go see that maybe next weekend. Because I have to do the, uh, I promised I'd do a Florida law review this weekend for Dr. Pennebin. And um, I really don't like going, um, I, I really don't like going to do movies and stuff when I have to wake up like early on a Sunday. And then over the summer, I'm teaching funeral law at Miami Dade, um, 9.50 to 11.30, I think, Mondays and Wednesdays which means I have to leave my house by like 8 a.m. if I don't want to get stuck in traffic for ever. That's the damnedest thing in Miami, man. If you leave at 6, you're good. You leave at 7, forget it. You won't get there until like 8.30. So I have to leave like 8.15, 8.20, and then I'll get there probably about maybe like 35 minutes, which is normal drive time. Guardians 3 better be good. Like, it legit better be good. My nephew went to go see it, and he said it was it was a good movie. And I'm going to be sad because, I man, I like the cast. Like, I legit like the cast. So I don't know if I'd want to see a Guardians 4 if um, 
if uh, Dave Batista isn't Drax, just because I think he owns it. But I'll absolutely go see like the next X Men movie as soon as they find the next person for um, for Wolverine. Like I. I, I see the deep fakes with Henry Cable playing uh, uh, Wolverine. I'd absolutely go see that. Uh, do you find it interesting that those who used to be cosmetologists are now working or trying to become funeral directors and bombers? Not really. Um, part of that is because here in Miami, the majority demographic that we serve at Miami Day College's funeral service education program, according to our statistics, are females of African or Hispanic descent. And a strong number of them are licensed cosmetologists already. So uh, <clears throat> I don't find it surprising that they're, they're, they're going into that next thing. Uh, and a lot of them are their own uh, proprietors. Um, so these aren't just people working at like a fantastic Sam. These are people running their own salons or their own nail groups or stuff like that. And are now wanting to branch into a business that's going to give them a little bit more earning potential. So... Um, Oddly enough, I, I find them to be um, like you wouldn't think that, oh, yeah, you went to beauty school. Hey, man, you have to have some chops to go to beauty school. Not only do you have to have some brains because they learn more about the color world than we ever do in funeral service. Uh, they have to have uh, physical capability. And I've said for years that if I ever had the opportunity to do so, I would probably um, I would probably go to beauty school over a summer or something like that just because of the fact that um, I've always wanted to go to beauty school. And I think that would be a nice uh, companion education for me specifically if I was to be like a prep room manager or something like that. Because one of the areas I feel that I'm absolutely horrible at is anything to do with hair. I will not touch hair for any reason. I don't care who it is. Uh, I won't do it. I won't color. I won't trim. I want nothing to do with it until I've sat there and learned about it and played with it and gone crazy. I'll cut my own hair, and I do cut my own hair, but I will not do stuff on anybody else. And if it wasn't for, like, the obscene amount of years uh, I was on stage doing my own makeup, I'd probably be a lot less comfortable doing makeup than I am. And even then, I'm not that great. I'm just better than the average bear. Well, Mr. Beal, if you loved it, then that's – probably a fair estimation that I'm going to like it because you 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 and I seem to like the same exact movies. <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> and there's nothing I can do about that. Thing. Let me get my troops over. <laughs> ah, sucker. Actually, there might be Dude, I'm still pissed that I can't do any screen sharing because I was like so stoked that I uh, figured out how to use um, OBS Studio. And I'm like, yeah, I got all the scenes set up. I got everything. I got you know, the only thing I didn't get to uh, that I wanted to was I wanted to get some like really nice uh, transition screens and some uh, non licensed music and stuff so I could actually make this look like super professional. Um, and I'm kind of glad I didn't spend any money on like buying some royalty free stuff because then the damn studio didn't work. Uh, yeah, makeup and hair is a challenge for me, too. I have a few friends who specialize in it and have been asking them lots of questions. And, dude, you could teach yourself from YouTube. Like, there's plenty of single dads who uh, learn makeup and learn hair and do stuff like that and start posting stuff and literally just start in their channel. Look at their earliest videos. Work forward and see where they're at. And you see these folks went, like, almost pro. Like, I'm not saying that it's the greatest thing on earth, but it's certainly cheaper and you could self-pace it. Um Earlier on in the, in the live stream, I said I don't watch TV. I don't watch any broadcast TV. But I probably spend at least 15 hours a week watching YouTube videos on everything. Like, you name it. Everything. Um, in fact, last two days, I probably spent about six hours uh, on and off just trying to cram how to do live streaming and different tools you can use for live streaming and learning to use things like uh, OBS uh, and others. That's how I learned it all. That's how I learned Excel. That's how I learned Photoshop. That's how I learned anything on the computer is me going on YouTube and watching videos on it and then playing with it and going back and watching more videos, etc. cetera. <coughs> uh, 
Um, I want to turn on the firewall. Right. Uh, any recommendations offhand for uh, online YouTubers who do dad makeup? Uh, I am happy to look here in a second. Let me just push this button. Firefox, where are you at? Keep it coming in chat, man. I got probably at least another 30 minutes in me before uh, I tap out. Let's see. Um, let me just do this. I, I just got this emergency email from the program board here. Miami Dade College saying, can you do something? I'm like, yeah, I can do something. I can help you out. Then we can go digging on YouTube looking for how to put makeup on people. I really like the ones with like the old guys who do um, their wives' makeup because they can't do anymore. There we go. Okay. Let's... I know if I don't do this now, uh, I think the registration system is locking tonight. So, 10 seconds later. We'll let that start doing its thing. Jump over here to YouTube. So I, I don't know how this is going to screw up my bandwidth. Um, let's see. Let's do basic makeup tutorial for dads. The first one that pulls up for me is your scumbag. Your scumbag dad gives you a makeup tutorial. Okay, doing zombie makeup. Um, yes, dads isn't the just do basic for men. Uh, we have guys putting makeup on themselves. There we go. I suppose that would actually be fairly useful. Um, Yeah, I can see where this is probably going to get you on the uh, National Security Agency's list of people who are looking at, like, boys putting on makeup. <laughs> like, I'm not even joking. Oh, my God. Um, so uh, I'll drop it in chat. Now, I, I don't know if this is good. I don't know if this is bad. But uh, men's natural makeup. And Carl Cunard from four years ago, 800,000. Um, this is a dude literally putting makeup on himself. And, I mean, from here, like, just go literally look at stuff. Um, let's see. Here's that. Here's the link. Boom. Um, I think that's probably fairly important because we're not used to putting makeup on dudes. And that's usually where the makeup looks up the worst. So uh, the idea of layering the makeup, feathering it, and making the proper uh, highlights versus shadows, um, that might be a good one to start with. Just saying. And we are done. Yep, that's right. <coughs> Yeah. Of course.
And goodbye, Outlook. All right, back to it. Uh, tech YouTube. Yeah, yeah. I mean, God, I've used. I can't tell you how much. So I bought a, my first. Uh, I bought my first home. That's not home in now. Uh, two years ago, and I have used that for every DIY, anything that I've needed, uh, from plumbing to you name it, drywall, everything. Um, YouTube. You, you, YouTube is great. YouTube is literally great for anything like that that you need to see. Is it worth you even trying it versus is it worth it just hiring someone? Uh, you're with the channel Knowing Better. That sounds familiar. Talking about Latter-day Saints and Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I was lucky that I actually had a, uh, when I was in Mortar School, we actually had, um, some pretty cool, uh, Mormons in our area and I was able to pick lots of brains about stuff like that. So I didn't have to rely on YouTube for it. And oddly enough, uh, right as I left, they elected a bishop. I, I think they, I think their bishops get elected. Um, the dude looked like me, like big, fat, chubby, red haired beard, you name it. It's all there. I thought that was the coolest thing on earth. He's a dude. He was such a cool guy. He's such a nice guy. Get nice service too. He used to. Do, he did a really nice service. Um, uh, here we go. Channel Bam. Who are you? Uh, I think I've seen a couple of his videos. Like, I don't have him, like, friended or um, anything like that, I don't think. But I think I've seen, I've seen, I think I've seen a couple of these pop up over the years. I didn't get too many people from uh, bringing their classes this time around. Last time we had California and a couple of places bringing classes. We did solid. Like, still, we're doing solid. And I even go on, like, Facebook and say, hey, what everyone's doing, it's butts over here. Stop looking at your damn TikToks. Hey, shout out to uh, Chandler Gilbert. Y'all had your um, your commencement today. Congratulations, graduates. All right, folks, I think uh, I think all the questions have finally dried up. Wait another minute or two here. If that's the case, we'll tap it out. Call it closed.
Might try to do some uh, live stream gaming at some point. I know that's a thing that people are into. Play dumb games. Stream. I don't have anything set up here for that, though. I don't think that's going to be a possibility. God, I have to move the TV and the Xbox and crap up here. I can bring up the PlayStation. All right, folks. I'm thinking uh, everything's died off. Thank you all for coming by, sharing, asking questions, going crazy. And um, look for the next one. Uh, I think I am going to do about every two weeks. Even if I just come up for like an hour, hour and a half, something like that, we'll just do that just to uh, just to hang out because apparently people like this. So everyone take care, and I will see you next live stream. Peace out.